It truly is extravagant, uh, the love of God towards us, towards his people. Uh, we, we often don't deserve, I mean, all the time, we don't deserve the love that God bestows upon us. But God, in his mercy, he looks at us not as we are, but as what we can become in him. Amen. And uh, today... A lot of the younger children that are in here are probably sad. They're like, oh, man, we don't have a children's story today. That's not fair. It's only for big kids. No, young people, I want to let you know that at this time we're going to be watching a video uh, for a moment. But before we get into the video, I just want to share something. You know, as, as a youth, as young people here in our church, we've been, we've been making this, this thing of living with compassion, actual, practical. We've been going out. And uh, this past month, we went down to Houston, and you all saw some of the video clips of things that we did, not just this, uh, during this trip in Houston, there was a few other random pictures that were thrown in there as well, just for fun's sake. But church, our young people are, are, are determined to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever they go. And, and I know that many of you who have accumulated youth are also being the hands and feet of Jesus. But today I want to encourage you for God to touch deep within you and you can really fully commit to him and say, Lord, I want to be, I want to be more proactive in really being the person that you've called me to be. You know, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 10, that there was a certain lawyer who showed up to Jesus and he stood up to tempt Jesus. And he said this in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answering said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said unto him, You, has an you have answered right. This do, and you shall live. The man, he was trying to justify himself, and he comes back with a question, and Jesus responds him, with the story that we're going to see right now on the video. Church, God has called us to be people that live with compassion and, and, and are a blessing to those around us. Let's watch the video and we'll get back to, to the message in just a second. Oh, Lord, be merciful to my family when I am dead. Ugh. bad. Who could have done such a thing? Thank you, sir. Thank you for stopping. Can you walk with 
Church, that's exactly what God has called us to. But some of you may be sitting there and saying, Pastor, I'm, I'm that, that guy that got jumped. I feel like that person. How many of you guys have, ever, have felt that way? You feel beat up. You feel like, man, this, this life is really destroying me. Friends, I have good news. Jesus is that good Samaritan that shows up to bring healing to your life. And Jesus does, d- doesn't just call you to now find this healing, but now he calls you to go and go and do what he has done for you. You see, freely you have received, he says, so freely give. And you may be sitting there and saying, but I'm stuck. I have so many problems. I have so many needs. So many things are going on in my life. How in the world can I help somebody else? Friends, that's, that's the very problem that we have. You see, we spend too much of our time focusing on my problems. And the more I focus on, the mo- on my problems, guess what happens? The more problems I end up having. You know, just a, a few days back, I was listening to a testimony of a pastor in Kentucky. And he begins to share this story of a girl who showed up at his church. You see, this girl who showed up at his church showed up in a way that probably a lot of churches would be caught by surprise if someone like this walked in. She walked in with purple and blue hair. She had piercings in her cheek and all over her face. She had chains, you know, all over. And she walks in, and, and this church had made a commitment. They had made a decision, and they said, look, we want to be a church that is a praying church. The Bible teaches that the house of God is a house of prayer. So they made a commitment, a decision that every single person who walked into their church would receive prayer. And every person that walked out of their church would walk out with prayer. No one was allowed to come in or leave without receiving prayer. So this lady walks in approximately around this time. The sermon has already begun. She sneaks in and she finds a seat. And then just as they're closing with the final song, she gets up and she starts walking out. And the pastor is sitting down and he's waiting to see if one of his members are going to stand up and go pray with the lady. Because she came in, nobody prayed with her, and she was walking out and nobody prayed with her. And the saints were so busy in their singing that no one got up to pray for her. So the pastor, in the middle of the whole service, gets up and runs down the aisle. The people are like, what in the world is happening? Does he have to go pee or something? No, no, no. He's going after this lady, and he runs out. He goes out the back door, and when he goes out the back door, guess who notices him? That girl notices him, and what does she do? She jets to her car. She runs as fast as she can go to her car. And the pastor takes off running, and right when she's trying to open the door, he puts his hand on the door and stops the door from opening. And she's like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. He's like, that's fine. You don't have to talk. I'll do the talking. What's your name? And she shares her name. And she says, I don't believe in you. I don't believe in prayer. I don't believe in anything. God doesn't answer prayers. He had been preaching about prayer. And he says, woman, here's the problem. God doesn't answer 
your prayers because God only answers Romanian's prayers. He was a Romanian. <laughs> and she's like, you're a crazy man. God doesn't only answer Romanian's prayers. God answers everyone's prayers. He's like, hold on now, woman, make up your mind. You just said that God doesn't answer prayers, and now you said that God answers everyone's prayers. Make up your mind. What's the situation here? She's like, no, God answers everyone's prayers, but God doesn't answer my prayers. He's like, what have you been praying for? She's like, I can't make it more than two hours without going back to my drug abuse. I've been praying and trying to stop doing drugs, but every time I try to stop, I go right back to them. And the, past, the, the, the Lord impressed this pastor to not talk to her anymore about prayer and to not talk to her about drugs. So he's sitting there and he says, that's your problem. She's like, what? He's like, you're doing drugs. And the more you pray to stop doing drugs, the more drugs you end up doing. Church, how many, how many of us have ever, have ever tried to make a commitment to stop doing something? And maybe, maybe you decide, you say, you know what? I'm not going to have any more Dr. Pepper. Or, or I'm not going to eat any more, any more Pringles. You know, those chips, they're, they're killing me. Once you pop, the fun don't stop, right? And, and, and maybe you've made that decision in your life. And you say, I don't want to do this anymore. But what happens is, everywhere you go, what are you noticing? You're noticing the vending machine. You, you go in the gas station and you see those Pringles, they're waving at you, you know? Like, everywhere you go, you, you find, you encounter the thing that you're not wanting to have. And then one, two, three days pass and you're like, man, I've been doing such a good job, I'm going to get a little can of Pringles, you know, like the small one. And then you fall right back into it. And the reason why that happens is because we spend all of our time dwelling upon the thing that we don't want to do anymore, rather than dwelling on the thing that we do want to do. So the pastor tells the girl, that is what your problem is. I've lived in that same situation. I've tried to give things up, and I focus on it so much, and I can't overcome it. So the lady's like, well, what in the world am I supposed to do then? He says, you need to give a Bible study. She's like, what? Give a Bible study? I need some, I don't even know how to give a Bible. He says, it's okay, I'll teach you. So he grabs he grabs a little Bible pamphlet, and he hands it to her. He says, look, you go. And he gives her the address. You go to this house. You give this person a Bible study. All you have to do, knock on the door. When they come out, you say, look, I gave you a Bible study. God bless. And walk away. That's all you have to do. And she says, okay. So he gives her the stuff. She gets in her car. She drives off. Fifteen minutes later, she calls him back. She's like, I hate you. I hate God. I don't believe in any of this. He's like, what happened? She said, I came to the apartment, it's all gated, I ring the doorbell, nobody answers, I can't get in, I can't give the Bible study, God doesn't even want me to give a Bible study. The pastor was like, woman, did you pray and ask God to open that gate? She says, I didn't think about that. He said, all right, pray for God to open that door. She says, okay, they hang up. About two minutes later, she calls back. I hate you. I hate God. He doesn't even answer my prayers. He's like, slow down, woman. What is going on? She's like, God didn't answer my prayer. I prayed for the gate to be open, and it's still not open. He's like, woman, you called me two seconds ago. How did you pray for this? She's like, I prayed for the door to open, and nobody came. He's like, you need to pray until the gate is opened. She said, what? So do you mean I pray for five minutes, and then the gate will? No, no, no. Pray until the gate is opened. She's like, so 15 minutes? No, no, no. Pray until the gate is open. She's like, an hour? Pray until the gate opens. Do you not understand English? He's a Romanian speaking to an American. So, so she's like, okay. So he hangs up the phone. Oh, and before he hangs up, he, he made a, a commitment with her. He said, look, I will stay in my office praying for God to open that gate and you pray for God to open that gate, and I will not leave or eat or do anything until God answers that prayer. So they hang up. They were both in agreement, and he stays in his office praying. Two and a half hours pass, and he gets a phone call back. She's like, Pastor, Pastor, you won't believe what just happened. He's like, woman, slow down. Let me decide if I believe or not. Just tell me the story. So she's like, Pastor, I was praying for about 15 minutes, and finally I got angry at God because he wasn't answering my prayer. So I started yelling at God, and he says, that's when you started praying. 
She's like, what do you mean? That's when I start. Yes, when you stop trying to be all pretty and formal and you finally opened your heart to God as to a friend, that's when you started praying. She says, and pastor, when I started yelling at God, guess what happened? A man walked out the gate. So I got out of my car and I went to the man. He had long hair, leather jacket. And I went to him and I said, excuse me, could you please open the gate? I need to go inside to apartment 14 and I need to give them this Bible study. My pastor said, if I give him this Bible study, it'll be good with me. So he says, I'm sorry, lady. I cannot open that gate for you. If they don't buzz you in, I cannot let you in. But I'm mad at you. And now the lady's like, what? Why are you mad at me? He said, because I requested Bible studies and you never came to give me Bible studies. So she was like, well, I can give you this Bible study. I'll go back to the pastor, get another Bible study and come back to apartment 14 and give them their Bible study. He said, you need to come with me. So she's like, "Uh oh. So he grabs her by the arm and they start walking together. And he takes her to his apartment. He opens the door. He says, you sit down right there. And she sat down. And then he said, you wait for me. And he walks out the door and leaves. 20 minutes pass by and she's nervous. She's scared. She has no idea what in the world is happening. She begins to pray for protection now. You know, God save my life. Spare me. Okay. The man ends up coming back 20 minutes later with 11 other men. Long hair, leather jackets, all biker, a biker gang. They all come back, and he, he tells the guys, sit down right there, and you guys listen to this woman. She is an angel sent by God. We have been praying for God to help us overcome our drug addictions, and God has sent someone to teach us the Bible so that we can overcome our addictions. And she's like, wait a second, wait a second. I'm trying to overcome my addiction, so I don't know how this is going to happen, but we might as well all do the Bible study together. So they sat down, they opened up the lesson, they put the DVD in, they watched the video, and they did the Bible study. At the end of the Bible study, all 13 of them were crying. God had been in that place. So she calls the pastor and she tells him the whole story. She's explaining to him the story. And she said, Pastor, this is the first time in years that I've been able to go more than two hours without having a drug craving. I spent six hours from 11 o'clock till 5 o'clock in the afternoon without having a craving for drugs. And the pastor said, woman, that's exactly what you need to do. Go and continue to think of the needs of others rather than thinking of yourself. You focus too much on yourself and you fall into the problem. But when you think of the needs of others and you live for God's glory to be revealed in the world, then God transforms you. The young girl is still a Bible worker at his church now. She's an official Seventh-day Adventist. She's dropped all the stuff and God is using her in a miraculous way to touch the lives of people in church. Church, we spend too much time. Young people, we spend too much time thinking about my problems, thinking about what I'm going through, trying to overcome my problems and focusing and dwelling upon those problems. You know, there's a song that I heard once. I'm not going to sing it to you because you guys would all die. Uh -huh. But, but the song says, it says, let me get to it really quick. I need to find it in my brain somewhere. The song says, the more you talk faith, the more faith you will have. Here, here's how it starts. In the strength of Jesus Christ, I will be a conqueror. The more you talk faith, the more faith you will have. Okay, and then the second verse goes on, you know, the whole song continues, but I'm just getting to the main point. The second verse goes on to say, the more you dwell upon discouragements, talking to others about your trials and enlarging upon them to enlist the sympathy which you crave, the more discouragements and trials you will have. Church, the point is this. God is calling us to take our eyes off of self and look upon him, the author and finisher of our faith. As we fix our eyes on Christ and begin to live for his name to be glorified, for his name to be revealed, for people to understand and know him, then our lives are transformed through that process. So I can't, I can't help it but to think of the story of Moses. You know, Moses is... Uh, with the children of Israel, and they've now created this golden calf. You all remember the story. And God is about to destroy them. And Moses says something that is profound, something that has stuck to me my entire life since I read it 
my entire Christian life, I'll say it that way. Moses said, Lord, if you do not forgive them, blot my name out of the book of life. Church, we find that Moses had this thing within him, and it's the very same thing that Jesus had within him, that he was willing to lose his salvation. Jesus was willing to lose everything so that someone else could find salvation and find victory over sin and self. Church, God is calling you and I. He's calling young people. He's calling those with accumulated youth. He is calling us all to get, lose sight of self, give our lives completely to him, and live for the blessing of someone else. Who cares if you're lost? Who cares if you don't make it to heaven? God didn't create you so that you could worry about you. God created you so that you could be a blessing to others, so that you could think of others. God's got your back. God is the most dependable person that you could ever have on your team. God's got your back. And God is calling us to acknowledge that, to lose sight of self and focus on the needs of those around us. You know, in Genesis we find that God shows up in the garden on the cool of the day to have dialogue with his creation, to spend time with them. The Bible teaches us, though, that our God is a consuming fire the Bible teaches us that those who have sin, if they come before the presence of God, will be consumed by that fire. And God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to be killed by his fire, so God, in his mercy, created a missionary. Church, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came, pardoned their forgiveness, pardoned their sin, and now he called them to be his hands and feet in this world. And we find that through the lineage of Seth, God has always had a missionary on this planet. God has called us to go and be his hands and feet, go and connect with those whom he cannot encounter face to face right now, because if he did, they would be done, done away with. God wants them to be saved. And God calls you and I to go and connect with these people, make an impact in their lives, help them know that if they lose sight of themselves and start focusing on others, God transforms their life and God sanctifies them. He justifies them. He makes them holy. And now they can stand before his presence, not because of their own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? God is calling us, church, to lose sight of of ourselves. I'll close with this final story found in the book of Acts. You know, just a few quarters ago as a church, we were reading through the book Acts of the Apostles, which focuses on the books from Acts all the way to the book of Revelation. It kind of focuses on those passages of scripture. And I found a quote in there that blew my mind, and I want to share it with you. It comes in the context of, of focusing and being compassionate, having practical compassion. There's a woman known in the Bible by the name of Tabitha, which is interpreted or is called Dorcas. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 9. And the Bible tells us that Dorcas, look at what it says. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36, it says, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds she did. That means service. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and she died. A woman who is living her life to be a blessing to those around her. The Bible says that she died. And if you continue reading the story, we find that the, those who were around her, they wept, they mourned, but they got a little bit excited because they realized that Peter was not too far away. So they go to the disciple Peter and they say, Peter, come over here. Dorcas is dead. Peter comes, he prays, and God brings Dorcas back to life. Church, look at what this book, Acts of the Apostles, says. Dorcas... Her skillful fingers were more active than her tongue. 
Is that what would be said of you and me? This woman went around. She helped those in need. She knew who was hungry, who needed clothing. She knew who was going through things. And she showed up in their lives and she was a blessing to them. Practical ministry. The Bible says that God saw fit to bring her back to life. And look at what the book, the author of the book says in a a few paragraphs later. Dorcas had been of great service to the church. And God saw fit to bring her back to life that her skillful and and that her skill and energy might still be a blessing to others. Church, I have a question for you. If you were to die today, would God see fit to raise you from the dead because of your skill? and energy would be used to be a blessing to others. That is a question I cannot answer for you, but it's a question that's been on my mind since I read the book. God, if I died today, would you see fit to raise me back up because you see that I could continue to be a blessing to the church, that I could continue to be a blessing to the world around me? Church, God has called us to be a peculiar people, to be a different people. And unfortunately, we as members of the church, Christianity, we've gotten so comfortable to our pews. It's nice. It's warm. It's comfortable. God is calling us to do something outside of ourselves. Like I shared before, our young people have been focused on doing ministry, connecting with those in need. We've fed homeless. We've provided clothing for them. We've painted houses. We've changed drywalls. We've helped people that have gone through storms and tornadoes and hurricanes. God has has used your children, many of your children, probably not even half of your children because a lot of them don't show up. So parents, I want to encourage you. Bring your children. Let them be a part of the mission that God has given to his people. But, but God has been using those who have been coming, and God has transformed many of their lives. You've seen a lot of them be baptized. A lot of the young people who came to these things, coming not knowing why, because I have too many problems, Pastor. I don't even know why I'm here. I just kind of came to have some fun. I've had a few of them tell me that. And we did have fun, but their lives were changed when they started focusing on others and not focusing on themselves. Church, God is calling us to do just that. A lot of you have been noticing the weird shoes that I'm wearing today. In your bulletin, you'll find there's an insert there that talks a little bit about the shoes, and we'll show a couple videos. But as a youth in our church, our, our goal for this month of April, we're wanting to raise some money to supply shoes to children who are in need. There are people around us who have nothing. I believe that there's 1.5 to 2 billion people in the world who actually suffer from different sicknesses and diseases that they get through their feet because they don't have proper footwear. And we as a youth have decided that we want to do some practical compassion. We want to supply this need in the world around us. And we have chosen, we have volunteered to help out uh, in, this, in this mission, The Shoe That Grows, to help out kids in need in the countries of Kenya and Ethiopia. Church, there are children there who need our help. And maybe you don't know how to do what, you know, you have no idea what to do. Go on the website. We have the inserts there. It's on our newsletter as well online. Click on it. You can go on there. You can donate some money. If there's some of you who cannot donate money, because money is not the the go-to answer for everything, God wants you to show practical compassion to people around you. You have neighbors. You have friends. You have church members who are in need, who are struggling, who are suffering. And God has placed you here on this planet. God has placed you here in this country to be a missionary. You see, we often think that the mission field is somewhere outside of here. But as I look around, I see that I think 99% of us are immigrants. God has brought us from our homeland to this place. And he's brought us to this place for a purpose, to be a missionary. God has brought you here to make an impact in those lives of the people that are around you. Church, let us stop thinking about self and start focusing on being a blessing to others. 
At this time, we're going to play the story of Ludi. She's a little Haitian girl. And see how these shoes have been a blessing to her and how they can continue to be a blessing to countless others. This ministry has, has helped over 94 countries already with children in need. And we want to be a church that helps, once again, a couple more countries to supply shoes, supply work, supply the needs that people in these places need. May God bless you and just watch the video and I'll be back up in a second. Ludie Pierre Toussaint is 12 years old. She lives in Marsh Canard, Haiti with her five siblings. Her dream is to one day become a teacher. Her family is very poor, and like most children in Haiti, Ludie faces many challenges, often eating only one meal a day. Shoes are another one of those challenges. Some years, Ludie didn't own a pair of shoes. Even when she had shoes, they didn't fit or would wear out quickly on her five-mile walk to school. Shoes are part of her school uniform, so she wasn't allowed to attend without them. The shoe that grows can help Ludie. With the shoe that grows, she can not only have her own pair of shoes, but a pair of shoes that adjusts and expands five sizes for up to five years. She can always have shoes for her school uniform, and she can always have shoes protecting her feet as she walks the many miles to school. We just want to ask you all to, to join us in this endeavor. We're trying to help kids that are in need, people that are in need around us. And it's not just something that we want to do abroad. We want to continue to make an impact here in our local communities. We've been going through a sermon series where Pastor Byron has gone through our church vision statement. We are a growing family risking everything in Christ to forge friendships, to create disciples, and to transform our communities before Jesus comes. And, and church, by, by being missionaries, by doing the work that God has called us to do, we accomplish those very things. We create friendships with one another as we go out on the field and we work together. We, we, we create disciples by the, those who are walking with us on a daily basis, are observing how you're living your life, and they begin to ask questions, and we be, we're able to now encourage and teach them and, and show them how, what it means to walk with Christ. And then we transform the very community that we live in by bringing an impact, bringing Christ in a very practical form through his people. So church, join us as we, as we go through and, and, be a, and, and strive to be a greater blessing to the world around us. At this time, we're going to close with our closing song. The song team will come up. The Lord is good. And... Um, and we can always depend. We can depend on God. He's very dependable. Let us, let us lose sight of self and come to him. Find in him the very thing that we need and then go and be a blessing to others. Even if we don't feel different, even if we don't feel changed, but let us go like that young lady who went with her purple hair, with her earrings and all. 
she went and began to be a blessing to those around her, and by doing that, God changed her. May we make the same choice. Amen. Please stand as we sing.